judges will introduce themselves. Hi, good morning and congratulations for making it to the, the national finals, uh, virtual as it may be. Uh, we're really thrilled that you guys have uh, chosen to participate, even though I know your schools are probably closed and it's been more work than, than usual, uh, but it, it's going to be a lot of fun and, and we're glad we could uh, be here with you this morning. My name is Ben Glickman. Uh, I'm a supervising deputy attorney general with the state of California. Uh, far more importantly, I'm an alumnus of this fine program, and uh, some 25 years ago, I was on a national championship team. Uh, we didn't have Zoom back then. Uh, we barely had the internet. Uh, hi, my name is Candida Steele, and I'm retired as a judge on the U.S. Civilian Board of Contract Appeals. I handled federal government contract disputes around the country. and um, this is probably my 20th year hearing of We The People. I, the first program I heard, my cousin was participating in, and I've been hooked ever since, 20 years ago. And hi, I'm Marsha Holland. I'm in Missoula, Montana. I was a career public defender in Alaska for 22 years, but now I teach at the law school here in Missoula. And I have been participating in this program for about as long as everyone else judging this program. I really support it. So thank you for making the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Go ahead and introduce yourselves when you're ready. Hello, you're unit three from Grant High School in Portland, Oregon. Uh, my name is Bernadette Robinson. My name is Maya Elliott. I'm Audrey Bauman. I'm Corinthia Brown. And our teacher is Miss D. Pasquale. All right, you guys ready? All right, so unit three, uh, you should know the question, it'll be no surprise. Uh, it is number three, and I'll, I'll read it for the benefit of, of the video. Uh, in 2020, we celebrate the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which recognized the right of women to vote. Despite recent controversy, the Equal Rights Amendment has not yet been declared ratified. What are the similarities and differences between these two amendments? What impact, if any, has the 19th Amendment had on women in achieving equality with men in the United States and around the world? What are the advantages and disadvantages of states passing their own equal rights amendments rather than ratifying a national constitutional amendment? Whenever you're ready. The fight for women's suffrage was a long and bitter one. And the fight to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment is a continuation of a greater struggle towards gender equality. Ratified in 1920, the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote. Its practical effect immediately granted white women suffrage, while women of color were largely denied the right to vote until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Equal Rights Amendment was proposed in Congress three years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment and offered women greater protections under the law. It eventually passed through the Senate in 1972, but the states failed to ratify it within the congressionally imposed seven year time limit. Similar to the 19th Amendment, the ERA establishes that people cannot be treated differently by the law solely because of their gender. Both amendments were also originally part of the same movement. The original ERA from the 1920s was written by members of the National Women's Party, the same group who fought for women's suffrage. The key difference between the 19th Amendment and the ERA is the types of protections each establishes. The 19th Amendment has a very narrow scope of protection because it explicitly prohibits the existence of laws denying people the right to vote based on gender. The ERA provides women with a much broader scope of protections, banning gender discriminatory laws in all walks of life, including education, employment, domestic relations, and medical care. The passage of the 19th Amendment marked a turning point in the movement for women's equality. Discussions about the Equal Rights Amendment started soon after, sparking a conversation surrounding the expansion of gender rights beyond voting. The movement continued and, beginning in 1971 with the case Reed v. Reed, the Supreme Court started to apply the Equal Protection Clause to gender discrimination. In addition, gaining the right to vote became, gave women the, right, the essential key to unlock many other rights. As Susan B. Anthony famously said, there will never be complete equality until women themselves can elect lawmakers and make laws. When women can vote, they can elect officials to Congress and be elected to Congress themselves. 
in order to pass laws that benefit women and further equality. This phenomenon extends to the judiciary. Landmark United States Supreme Court cases that protect women's reproductive rights, such as Roe versus Wade and Griswold versus Connecticut, were decided only after women were able to participate in the political process. The women's suffrage movement that was raging throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries was not contained to the United States. Soon after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Britain granted women the right to vote. However, in many ways, the United States has lagged behind other countries in granting women access to the political process and in electing them into office. Although the National Equal Rights Amendment has not been ratified, 26 states currently have their own versions of this amendment. A major advantage of states passing their own ERAs rather than having a national ERA is that this system allows for laws that better reflect the ideas and beliefs of the people within those individual states. In addition, these states with an ERA serve as laboratories of democracy for the country, testing out the effectiveness of the amendment before it is implemented nationwide. A major disadvantage of a state-by-state -state approach is that women in the states without an ERA do not benefit from its protections. If the Equal Rights Amendment were to be passed, Alice's Paul's goal to give women the equality in law they have won at the polls would be realized. Thank you, we are ready for your questions. Thank you, just a reminder to put away your notes, please. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. On January 15th this year, um, the Virginia um, legislature passed the ERA, uh, even though it was out of the date, out of the time frame scheduled by Congress. Um, do you think the archivist should register it as a, as a subsequent amendment? I believe it shouldn't. A major issue with the ERA currently is that many states who previously did um, ratify um, actually reversed their decision. And so it is a bit confusing at this point uh, which states are on board with uh, ratifying the amendment and which are not. And the entire process is a little bit confusing. To add on to my colleague's statement, um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said herself that because states are rescinding their ratification, she believes that, quote, we should start over because um, it isn't fair to have states rescind their ratification, but still accept latecomers' ratifications. To respectfully disagree with my colleagues, there have only been about four states who have rescinded their ratification of the amendment. And there is currently enough support for the amendment for it to possibly be passed and made a law. And if it's already able to be a law, it just should be able to be one. And there are plenty of states who haven't um, retaken their ratification, like Hawaii, who have had it for a very long time. In addition, there are other amendments that have been drawn out much further, even though they did not have this cutoff. An example would be the 27th Amendment, which was ratified 200 years after it was first proposed. So I have a follow-up question somewhat related. So section two in the Equal Rights Amendment is, ha, was held up as a reason why so many women opposed it when it was first um, presented. Do you think that the Equal Rights Amendment should be rewritten to better clarify section two? Because at the time the concern was Congress controlled its implementation and Congress was primarily men at that time in the 70s. Any thoughts? Even though the amendment was perhaps a concern and the legislation that it might pass, we must also consider that women's rights and the right to vote was also decided by men. Okay. Um, and so we might give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Um, in addition, uh, Congress is continually diversifying. Uh, the number of women um, has increased since the 1970s. In addition, other amendments have this uh, section um, in there, such as the 14th Amendment, um, and it can be a very useful way of enforcing um, such a fundamental aspect of what should be part of our democracy. Adding on to what my um, colleague said, 
some of the landmark United States Supreme Court cases that have expanded women's rights, such as Griswold versus Connecticut and Roe versus Wade were decided on all male courts. So just because Congress is all male at the time does not mean that it can't be a champion for women's rights. However, the fear is understandable as even though men did help pass for the right to vote for women, there were many men who did object to it as they believed that women shouldn't have to bother with such a thing as voting because they believed they were too fragile and should just stay in the home. So there is still that fear that there are some men who would want to restrict women's rights. Thank you. Shifting gears a little bit, in your prepared remarks, you, you talked about gender a lot. That was the word you used, but these amendments actually use the word sex. Is there a difference uh, in, your, in your mind and what, what is that difference and how might it affect the scope of the amendment? I believe that the difference between sex and gender is um, how we view gender today. Sex normally means a binary gender, so that's male or female. Um, while the Supreme Court has interpreted that to include um, transgender people who identify with binary genders, it does not include people who identify outside of the binary, for example, non-binary people. And um, by using the word term gender, it would be more inclusive to those people than just using the term sex. Also, all courts except for the 10th Circuit, all circuit courts except for the 10th Circuit have a um, recognize the word sex in Title VII to apply to gender identity and protect against gender discrimination. And currently there's a case pending in the United States Supreme Court, um, Harris Funeral Homes versus Equal Employment Opportunity that will decide whether um, gender identity um, would be part of sex for Title VII. So this will kind of foreshadow whether the language sex um, and the Equal Rights Amendment would apply to gender. So to fill the, we have about um, 30 seconds left. Uh, as you know, the 19th and the 15th and the 26th are written in, in a way that does not provide an affirmative right to vote. It talks about you cannot be denied. Why do you think they were written that way? Like many other um, amendments in, within the Constitution, they either give positive or negative rights. Negative rights would protect something from happening, like you cannot be denied the right to vote on the basis of race. May I finish okay. my statement? Please do. On the other hand, you have positive rights, with, which confer rights upon the individual. Um, it is very often within the Constitution that they give negative rights to prevent the government from overreaching its power. Thank you. That's the, that's the biggest difference with doing this on Zoom. There's not the huge round of applause. Um, but, but no, no, uh, I am commending you on your performance. You guys did great. Um, nor, ordinarily, I would tell the whole class to breathe. The first one's over, but it's, it's <laughs> there you go. Um, Oh, you're, and your teacher's uh, applauding as, as she should. Uh, so, you know, not, not surprisingly, you guys are very well prepared. Uh, you answered all parts of the question. Um, you, you know, said some thought-provoking uh, things in the question that led then to follow-up questions in particular. I, I, I think your use of the word gender was probably intentional. Um, you know, knowing that I know you read the amendment and know that it uses a different word. So I, I, I I think I appreciate that that strategy, and and in the Q and A, you know, I wish we had more time. As always, everything we threw at you, you were able to to address and, and provide you know support for, whether that's uh, you know other constitutional provisions, case law, uh, the experience uh, in history or in other countries, and so I was just uh, very impressed overall. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll add the same um, overall. It was great. I like your backgrounds, except some of you. It's an interesting new world we're in. I wanted to say that I think it was really important, and you did it, to emphasize that even though when the 19th Amendment was passed, it didn't really impact every woman in the country in the same way. And it took the Voting Rights Act to make sure that everyone could participate in that um, process. And that idea that you hit upon in terms of the 
right now the United States is lagging a little bit in terms of how the 19th Amendment changed the world and society is a really good point to make. And finally, you re I really like the fact you know about the pending case and that shows you've done a lot of additional research. That's really, you know, I was an appellate attorney in part and that's a really cool thing that you guys all took the time to look that up and understand that this is going on in your lifetime and it's a really big deal. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree. I think you did a really wonderful job. Um, I, I very much appreciated that you uh, talked about Title VII. Certainly talking about the um, Harris case was wonderful. The difference between sex and gender, positive and negative rights. You, you hit a lot of nails. Um, and I, I really appreciated your presentation. You, I hope even if you had to do most of it at home by yourselves, have had a really fabulous experience going through this um, process. Your teacher, I'm sure, is fabulous, and I'm to to have you here. She must be. Um, it, I hope that you will use this not just to get yourself into a good school or to to continue in your lives, but that it might inspire you to choose a career that involves civics. Um, those of us who are here are lawyers, and I'm a lawyer partly because of, of what I can do for the society that I'm living in. And I hope that you, you all have shown that you would be superb representatives for the rest of us. Um, you understand, I'm sure, more than my law school class understood about the Constitution. Uh, maybe not Marsha's. Hopefully they know a little better than, than my class did, but you were further ahead than my law school class was. So you haven't even gotten out of high school. And if you do as well as you've done today, um, I would be rocking very happily in my rocking chair and in a nursing home thinking that you've taken care of us and will be representing us as lawyers or judges or uh, congressmen um, I, and senators. I hope you have a wonderful time with it and have enjoyed this. We really have enjoyed you. Thank you.